Um, we, we have one question in, and I picked up one or two points here. So, um, your comorbidities, um, in terms of how do the multidisciplinary team mm -hmm. factor comorbidities and your CLL into the equation mm -hmm. to give you the optimum treatment plan for your overall health? Yeah. Yeah, because because sorry, we don't see the MD, an MDD team as a yeah. patient, but mm. you are a critical part of it. Yes, no, they're very good questions. So we have the multidisciplinary meetings, and if any patient who uh, goes on to treatment uh, is discussed at one of these, you probably know that they they were introduced for cancer care, probably going back fifteen years or more, um, because in those days people could be given cancer there on the basis of one consultant's management plan and this was you know this was the Kalman reforms and it was to make sure that there was consensus and people weren't doing their own little thing essentially so now we do that and how it's done is the patient will lead uh, so you know you will put your patient into the discussion and we have it every week and um, you present the patient to the group and um, then you discuss the question. So we typically look at the radiology, the CT if it's done, the pathology, and then you have a clinical discussion. And I think in discussions are made, you can see that that flow chart is broadly based around, I would say, fairly objective grounds. Genetic status, IGH status, age. So that gives you a rough idea what you might be aiming for, but then come in, of course, clinical on comorbidities and so forth. So if you had somebody with heart disease, you might not, let's say, be so keen on a BTKI drug. And um, so that might be one factor. Venetoclax might be if your kidney disease, you know, more kidney disease because you've got to clear out the tumor lysis. And these are the sort of factors that you bring into the discussion. Uh, and generally, they're typically very well done and it's very safe uh, approach. And um, this is one of the reasons that I'm confident that you know we do have excellent management to see a lot in this country actually. Um, Shingrix. Yeah. Should it be available to the immunocompromised below the current threshold of 70 years of age? I think it that would be clinically very sensible and I'm hopeful that there may be some movement on that in the next 12 months. So I think watch this space. It's a transformational vaccine and um, our first step is to make sure that people in the right age group now are getting it in CLL, but I would say that I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's extended. Thank you. Right, uh, a question from the floor. Uh, I'm interested in joining the Evosheld trial. Yeah. Um, what are your views, the side effects, and the risks of being put on it? Yeah, okay. Um, I'll take it the other way backwards I can start from the bottom up because you by the way when everyone asks you two questions you always forget the second okay. I did it yesterday I knew I'm not going to forget that I forgot it so um, the second part of the question was side effects and risks I don't think there really are any significant side effects and risks to be honest as far as I can see so this is a monoclonal antibody given every six months as an injection and it's an anti-covid spike antibody it lasts a long time when we did the CLLVR study many some of which you patients here contributed to, we found that after four vaccines, 20% of people were not making antibodies. Mm. Not making antibodies. And the risk factors are people who've got low immunoglobulin, low antibody levels, no surprise. BTKI drugs, you know, talk about that antibody signaling. It, it damages that. And... Um, well, those are the two. People actually were just going into therapy. But that's another story. Um, so 20% not making antibodies. But, by the way, the vaccine is still great because it's also making cellular immunity. So please have your vaccines, whatever. But you would see that Evisheld ought to be obviously really valuable in that group because it's replacing the antibodies that you're not making. Now, of course, Evershield has been assessed in trials and found to be effective. It's available in many countries. It's the one, I've said how good our care is, but I suppose I would have to admit that's perhaps one weakness we've got, is we don't have NHS access to Evershield. 
Yeah, and we still don't. But it's available on private prescription. It's now a trial going on, but that's obviously going to take a long time to come through. It's a shame. Clinically, of course, the evidence and the value of Evershield may get a little squeezed because, well, two reasons. One is, I suppose, immunity is getting better because of lots and lots of vaccines, perhaps. But also because, as you know, the virus is mutating and changing away from all this sort of immunological pressure of the immune system. And so there is always concern whether Evershell can keep up with the new virus variants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say at the moment it's certainly effective against Omicron and um, it's probably a very good drug, particularly for patients with CLL. Remember, if you look at patients with immune suppression, which is where Evershell might be used, we're talking about potentially half a million people in the UK because you're including all sorts of conditions. But patients with CLL, I would say, are towards the top of the need of that group. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. okay. Questions there? Lovely. Um, and this was an online question. Uh, what's the difference between pirtobrutinib <laughs> and Nurix? Nurix. Nurix. Oh, gosh. Well, I'm glad you got it. Well, I was the only one, but I'm not. I, I don't think I. They always say if you don't know, just say you don't really know. I don't really know. Um, what, what I'm saying about BTKI drugs is that there are new drugs coming through. There is Zanibrutinib and there's Pertabrutinib. And um, they will find a place. They're not really licensed yet. They're in clinical trials. Some of them are available in, in studies around the cu country for people who really are struggling with the current regimes that we have. One of the great things about these drugs is BTK, Brutinib, so it's lock and key. I don't know if anyone's from Wolverhampton, but I like, you know, there's a chub factory there. They used to make all the locks of the world. And so lock and key, th shapes fitting together. If you've got your BTKI drug, Ibrutinib sticks in that and it covalently, that means it fixes a bond. Remarkable. It cannot get away. Yeah, it's wonderful. And if, you'd, sir, if you were a chemist in, in GSK or whatever, they didn't make that drug, by the way, but you know, if you're a chemist and you've got a drug that sticks and forms a bond, you think, brilliant, that is a wonderful drug, and it is a wonderful drug. Some of these new drugs, like pertubrutinib, they have a slightly different action. They, they bind to the BTK, but they, are, they reverse. They don't stick on. And you would think that might be a weakness. Actually, it can be a benefit. Because the BTK drug can make mutations, and therefore the lock and the key can't fix. Ibrutinib doesn't actually able to bind because it's escaped it. But it doesn't seem to be able to escape this slightly more flexible drug. So it's very, in I don't know if we've got any chemists in the room, probably not. I'm not a chemist. But anyway, it's a very interesting mechanism of action. Clinically, it means we've got another option. Right. Okay. Um, a question from the room. Um, Heart issues uh, as a result of uh, ibrutinib, an increase in heart rate. Um, so, what is the treatment? Or yeah. Sorry, that's me asking. I was just asking: is there, is there a link in terms of someone having a low pulse? Yeah. Or equally, an increased heart rate as a result of using ibrutinib. Yeah. I would say with ibrutinib, there is the 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 cardiological and. Impl side effects high, uh, in t on order of incidence hypertension, high blood pressure particularly when it's used for first line therapy not so much with relapse therapy I don't quite know why that would be the case but there is that hypertension of course is managed it's a nuisance but it, it's manageable the second is atrial fibrillation which you know your heart beats regularly but sometimes it can just go irregularly that's quite common as you get older but there's no doubt these drugs increase it. Usually that's manageable. Yeah? You um, may have to have a cardiac tablet to slow down the rate. You may have to unfortunately go on to a drug that reduces your blood clotting because it's a risk of stroke. But generally it's manageable. Some people have to go into hospital in the short term because they're a bit breathless with it. That's less common. So that's the second common thing. Then the, I suppose the other thing which was talked about but has been rarely been seen as more severe 
heart arrhythmias, to be honest, and that's, that's very exceptionally rare, if, if at all. Steady increased heart rate or steady low heart rate, I don't think are particular side effects. You know, just so-called sinus rhythm. No, I don't think we can associate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one point you made, which kind of changed the emphasis slightly for me earlier on in your presentation, was the, the predisposition within yeah. the family. Yeah. Uh, from my experience, when I, and I'm quite happy to share my, my diagnosis without asking you for a clinical diagnosis, yeah. but well, when I was diagnosed, we didn't have children. Yeah. Or should I say, I need them both now. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, this is where the BCH guidelines are, are, are good, actually, because they start to talk about these vaccinations more than they ever did before. And I think that's a slight shift we're going to see um, in guidelines in general. It's not just about treatment. It's also about the co-management. I think we start to, in this area, to get away from a strong evidence base, to be honest. We, you know, that I can't give you a clinical trial that says in that situation you should do that. I think one pragmatic approach that you might take in that situation is actually to have your pneumonia antibodies measured, which you can have done in a clinical immunology lab. And if they're suboptimal, then I think you should go for the Prevenar situation, uh, the vaccine. That would be a reasonable approach. So, yes, the, the situation with pneumonia is that there are these two types of vaccines, Pneumovax, which is typically given to the adult population, and Prevenar, which we give to children, actually, uh, which seems to be a slightly different formulation. But patients with CLL seem to get a boost from having the Prevenar. And so when we start afresh with new patients, we should be giving Prevenar first, Followed up later by Pneumovax. Okay. Thank you. Um, continuous venetoclax yeah. versus time limited. Yeah. What, what's the position on the debate on that one? Yeah, I didn't talk about continuous venetoclax. That was how it was really introduced a few years ago. Um, but the drug companies made this sort of decision that the BTKI of groups, companies on the whole, went for single agent. Yeah, they, they, they fiddle with antibodies, but in this country we're not allowed to. Whereas venetoclax uh, companies went for dual, to be honest, and so we got venetoclax with rituximab, venetoclax with ibinutuzumab. But when it was first introduced, like many new drugs, it is, was a single therapy tablet that you took every day. That still exists on the flow chart. It's still an effective therapy. And it particularly might have a role in people who need second dose of venetoclax. You know, so let's say you've had VR or VO, so let's say VO first line, and then you've had a BTKI, and then you're still, and you need something else, then the, v, the venetoclax monotherapy might be an option. In terms of the relative efficacy, I don't think there's a head-to-head -head comparison okay. of fixed duration versus continuous. Right. And I, oh, Mark? Yeah, hi Paul. Hi. Um, I spend a lot of time as a trustee <coughs> with the pharmaceutical companies, particularly yeah. the big five in the area. Yeah. And I, I think they think I push them too hard. Uh, the cynic in me says, it's great that they've got these new therapies out, but as you said, they're not cured, they're yeah. management of it. Should I still be pushing a, <laughs> for a cure, um, where the route is to a cure? Do you see a cure? Yeah, that's a very, very fundamental question. We should probably address cure. Um, well, there's, there's absolute cure, isn't there? And there's functional cure. You know, in, 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 in cancers, we can get absolute cure. We can clear things. You know, classic one is in leukemia. There's aggressive leukemia in children, for instance, which obviously can be fatal. But if you, the chemotherapy appears to get rid of it, you know, and they've got a normal lifespan. That's what the ultimate cure we can achieve it with some diseases. So that would be great with CLL. We don't be able to, the only situation in CLL where we can get to that is probably with a bone marrow transplant. We really can do that. And CAR-T, which I haven't really done. We may do it there. I hinted at it with the chemotherapy and that, do you remember that mutated thing? There's debate about that. But as you say, with the bulk of what I've talked about today, we're talking about suppression. Uh, of the disease to very, very low levels. And that's why people love to measure minimal residual disease and see if it becomes negative. That's still not the cure that we really, really want, I don't think. It's functionally a cure, but it's, it's not the same thing. 
What will it take to do that? Well, ultimately what would be nice to do is to cure and eradicate the CLL tumour itself and leave the other B cells quite healthy. Do you know what I mean? BTKIs are great, but they do damage all your B cells. And so the next generation might be something that really talks something specific about the CLL cell in a, in, a, in a targeted way and gets rid of it. So that's something. There's still things to aspire to. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much.